Hey, this is Chris, Infinite Realities, and we are live with amazing writer, amazing artist, Mr. Dan Jurgens. How are you today, sir? I'm great, Chris. How about you? I'm doing well. I'm talking to one of my all-time favorites, so life is good for me. Everything's great, coming up. Thank you. <laughs> so what have you been up to lately? How, how, how have things been for you in the great weirdness? Well, good. I um, Great weirdness. I call it the great lockdown, uh, but it's been going well. I mean, we're still working and doing what we can to make comics for everybody. So we're uh, pushing full steam ahead. So you haven't gotten uh, like the pencils down or anything like that? Oh, no, not at all. Uh, it's our opportunity. If anything, we can get caught up a little bit, but certainly the books I'm working on, all my projects, we just keep pushing ahead and, and doing what we can to get them done and actually have just a little bit more time to um, treat them with a little more tender, loving care and kind of fine point some of the things like the coloring that comes in doesn't mean it's last minute, have to rush it out the door, things like that. So there are actually a couple of advantages here. Oh, awesome. So so what are you working on right now? What's the most recent thing you've, uh, you've been working on today? Right now, I am writing Nightwing and Batman Beyond. Uh, and trying to figure out how we can handle that as we enter this new future. I got to tell you, uh, our partner, Brandon, uh, loves all things Nightwing, has a Nightwing tattoo, and is in love with what you're doing with the character right now. So, Oh, that's great to hear. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, how is writing Nightwing? Is, is, is that fun? Because he's a beloved character, um, has had some ups and downs. How are you? How are you doing with the character? Are you having fun with it? I am. Uh, you know, I came in uh, sort of in the middle of a storyline, obviously, in which uh, he had, was then calling himself Rick, had lost his memory uh, because he had been shot by the KG Beast and uh, resulted with amnesia. And um, I, I came in on the middle of that. And the whole idea is what can we do? What can we find to make this make a little more sense, make it more of a Nightwing centric sort of story, kind of a bat story as well, since it all started with something in Batman. And I think we've managed to do that. And um, I think we've managed to turn it in a direction that has worked out very, very well for the character by using the Court of Owls and a couple of other things um, to make it seem a little less haphazard, if you will, and have it have a little more character meaning. And that's what comics always need. So it's what any good story needs. And I think we've managed sure. to do that. Dan, what was your journey into comics? My journey into comics? Uh, well, it, it really started as a kid when I was reading them. And I always thought it was a great vehicle just in terms of reading that I liked reading comics. And it all started for me with the uh, live action Batman TV series with Adam West and Burt Ward. I mean, I was like seven, eight years old when that came out. Uh, and that just captivated me. And then it was after that that I saw kids on the in the neighborhood trading comics on their front porch on one warm summer night. I didn't even know comics existed. And all of a sudden, there it was. And they had, you know, Batman comics. And then it's like, oh, this guy on TV is in this. And then it, they had Superman and everything else. And from that moment on, it's safe to say that I was hooked. So what was, um, what was your first professional work? I'm just curious. My first professional work was uh, war, was for DC. It was Warlord number 63. Uh, I started with them, I think, late 81. Um, Mike Rell had been doing a promotional appearance here in town. And at that time, Mike was the creator, writer, and artist on Warlord. Uh, and they were also kind of in the process of looking for a different artist. And I stopped and I showed Mike some of my work. And, you know, a couple months later, I was on the book and they, they said, well, we'll give you three issues and see how we like you. Mm -hmm. And after that, they never told me they didn't like me and I kept hanging around and here we are today. Now, one of the uh, most famous creations is Booster Gold. Uh, right. We have several customers who are absolutely in love with that character. Uh, Obviously very intelligent uh, customers, yeah. <laughs> But what was the genesis of that character? Because at the time, it's such a unique take, a superhero for profit. Everything he did was to make money. Well, even the logo know, had dollars. Yes, yes. 
he, he wanted to make money, but he did want to be a hero. Um, and what it was is he, he was making up for the mistakes he had made. Uh, you know, Booster Gold comes from the future. And in that future life, he had made more than his share of mistakes. And he determined to come back in time, be a hero, because those of us who make mistakes always kind of see it as, you know, if I could go back in time, I could fix all that and it wouldn't be a problem anymore. Uh, and Booster came back in time to be a hero, but he is someone who is so filled with human nature that he's very much a character who is flawed. And so if he sees a plane that is going to crash where a Superman might just fly up, catch the plane and save it, Booster would fly up and try to catch it, but first he might alert CNN or whatever and say, hey, come on out, you wanna film this, I, I wanna be on TV here because yes, um, Whereas Clark Kent could make a living as a pro, as a reporter, Booster Gold makes a living as a superhero. So he needs to make a buck somehow. Yeah, what's, what's, what's fantastic is the, the life that that character is taking on and even became a mainstay of an iconic uh, run of Justice League. Right. Now, and you took over Justice League uh, shortly after uh, when you were doing Superman at the same time. Um, you took over uh, a post-crisis Justice League, and it didn't have the big uh, the folks on it. And you were also coming off the heels of uh, Keith Giffen and uh, Demetrius. Right. So, right. what was, I guess, personally, like, what is your mandate taking over a book like that that had such a unique voice, and that did that that was uh, widely followed? So, how 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 do you how do you follow up on that? How do you prep for well, that? Well, part, part of it was uh, at that time. I had actually been offered the Avengers and uh, was thinking about doing that. And then DC said, well, would you rather do Justice League? And I said, well, as long as I'm here, I might as well. Uh, but the one thing I did say is, you know, uh, Keith and Mark had given it such the, their own personal flair with the idea of building humor into the series. And I said, look, I can't do that. That's not who I am as a writer. Uh, I think I can use characters like Booster Gold and Blue Beetle to still have them, that be part of the atmosphere. But at the same time, DC was at the point where they wanted to bring Superman and Wonder Woman and some, you know, Hal Jordan back into the books and have them be a part of it as well. So uh, what we did is a little bit of a blend of the various versions of a Justice League that had been in existence before. One was with the mainline heroes like Superman, which was very straightforward superhero stuff, but still retaining a little bit of the humorous aspect by using Guy Gardner and using Booster and Blue Beetle and things like that. So we, we kind of blended those two ideas um, and it was a lot of fun. I mean, I, I really enjoyed doing it. And whenever you're working with Earth's mightiest heroes, its greatest characters, you can't help but have. We have a comment uh, has popped up in the feed um, from Darius Washington. Your Superman work is wonderful. Some of the best in the modern era. You actually get what makes the character work. Thank you. Um, I want to echo that. I'm a Superman guy, and I discovered the Superman through the movies, but I discovered Superman comics uh, through your run on the character. So... How did Superman come about? How did you take over the character? Also, were you a Superman fan leading up to that? Yes, I was a Superman fan. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that, you know, he was a front and center uh, character. I mean, you know, he was like, you know, number five on the list or whatever. But um, I always found the character incredibly compelling to draw. And uh, DC had asked me, uh, Mike Carlin, who was editing the books at the time, Mike called me up one day and said, how would you like to draw Superman? I had done an annual for him and, and kept working after that and uh, drawing the, a couple of backup stories. And he, he asked me if I wanted to draw the character on a regular basis as written by George Perez. And I said, well, yeah, sure. I'd love to work with George. And um, we did a couple of issues together, but by that point, you know, George was already going to move on and go do some different things. And uh, they asked me if I would like to write it. And that's when I got a little bit intimidated because it's one thing to want to draw Superman and another thing entirely to say, yeah, I want to tackle him and find a way to find out 
if I can even think about writing. Um, but I did, I think I have a very nice connection with the character. I think I have a pretty good handle on what makes Superman work um, and what makes Clark Kent work and Lois and all of them. And it's been a very nice uh, relationship with a character over a long amount of time, which I think has done us both quite a lot of good. How do you approach writing a character like Superman? Um, you hear a lot of writers, they seem a little bit intimidated by the character and his power set. How do you, uh, what is your approach with, with Superman when you sit down to script one of his adventures? You know, the power set isn't a problem for me. I, I think to really <clears throat> write Superman is to first, and I think this is true of any character, you really have to say, start to identify who the character is for you. And, and how you want to approach that. And I think to identify Superman, you first have to identify Clark Kent and identify with how he, how he grew up. Um, what is important to Clark? What is his view of life? How is that important to him? How does that make him want to be Superman? And if so, then how does he conduct himself? And, and once you start to answer those things, then I think the power stuff, can start to work its way in because yeah, it's, it's, you have to come up with a villain that has more than his usual uh, power level or something like that. And you have to come up with someone, a villain with the proper motivation and everything, but <clears throat> that can be done. And that, that's hard for any character. It's always tough to try and find that right villainous presence for a hero. But once you understand Clark Kent, once you understand the values, that he was raised with, I think you can then start to build your Superman stories. So do you, uh, I first came on to Superman, uh, the first issue I ever like remember reading was when he reveals his uh, identity to Lois Lane. Um, you worked on some, to say iconic, is a little bit of an understatement as far as Superman stories you've worked on. And the most famous that everybody has been messaging us the week leading up to this is, obviously the death of Superman story. Um, can you give a little bit of context about like where the character was at the time and why DC uh, and, and, and the creators involved entertained the notion of killing the Man of Steel? Well, one of the things that we had been doing is from time to time already, uh, as we were working on the books, is we would look at previous stories and just say, is there anything here that can be updated? Do we have something here? Is there a core of an idea? And as everyone knows, uh, other writers had done some variation on the death of Superman before, because that's always a dramatic element for virtually any character. And the other part of it is that when you have a character die, in a way, that's when you can really explore the importance of the character. So it, it had come up in a couple of our meetings and we had never gone ahead with it. Uh, and we had a particular meeting where we had to find a replacement. And I think it's fairly well documented that Superman 75 had kind of been targeted as an issue where Superman and Lois Lane might get married. We had to put that off. And so we needed something else. I walked into the meeting. I had a yellow legal pad with two ideas written on it. One was Monster Destroys Metropolis, and the other one was Death of Superman. And we talked about them. We moved in and out of different ideas. Uh, you know, and some of it was just me wanting to do, and this was the monster idea, a knockdown drag out fight in Metropolis. I wanted to draw that because too many of Superman's villains at that time at that time were cerebral types. You know, Lex mm -hmm. Luthor did not have superpowers. Brainiac was more of a mind game guy. We had a normal powered character in Mr. Z. I just wanted Superman to be able to hit someone, you know, and someone who'd hit back. Um, and as we talked about different ideas, we moved in and out of them. Uh, on the other side of the room at one point, Jerry said, well, yeah, let's just kill him and we got into it again. And only then did we start to fuse the concept of, well, maybe this monster which would eventually become Doomsday, is the vehicle that we use. But it was also all driven by the idea of being able to tell a really good story and one that would explore Superman and what he meant to the world by removing him from the stories. Just like when we, any of us lose someone important to us, 
that's really when we start to think about them a little more, right? So it was always that effort, that ambition to tell a very good Superman-centric story. You know, the idea of it later being labeled a marketing center or whatever, none of that came into it. I, I mean, for us, it was as we put that all together, it really was about telling the best Superman story we could tell. Well, and structurally, Superman 75 is one of my favorites because I remember leading up to that, the panel structure got smaller and smaller. You would go from five panels per page to four panels. And then finally, 75 is one panel. And I, I'll never forget it. I, I was homesick in high school and my, my dad went and got Superman 75 for me. I, I had been waiting for it. And I tore open that black bag. And I must have read that issue four or five times. Because just like the, the your artwork on that, every page is like a still from an action movie. Sure. Thank so you. Thank you. Who goes to that? Like that, that stays with me. Um, also, uh, in our store, I can't see it here. We have a framed poster of a uh, promotional for Reign of the Superman. Because to your point, okay, the, okay. the year of story followed was fascinating. You had, you know, Ma and Pa Kent the, not being able to publicly mourn the death of their son. Lois not being able right. to publicly mourn the death of this person that she loved. So you're absolutely right. Got some amazing character exploration out of that. We did. And really, we spent an incredible amount of time talking about that. And as creators, and I, I should step back and just say that when we put these together, you know, it was great because we had... Uh, we had four books at the time, all four writers, all the art teams were in the room, so everybody could talk about that. And it really was. You know, what happens to his parent, Clark's parents, Ma and Pa Kent, when they see their son die on TV, yet they can't tell the world that just happened? Same thing with Lois. How does she explain her loss to the world um, when she knows, you know, Superman might be dead, but Clark is dead as well? Yet Perry White didn't know where the hell Clark Kent was. You know, I mean, it, it was all that. And that's what we got into, which was, what are we going to say about the character? What can we explore here? And what was so fascinating to me is that as we were exploring the importance of what Superman meant to the DC universe, in reality, because it became widely known among, out there in the world that, you know, here's DC Comics and they're killing Superman, you had newspaper columnists writing about that same thing. And they were addressing what does it mean? What does that say about us when they take Superman away and they have to kill him? So at that, at that moment, what we had was this really amazing duality and kind of doing the gear thing here between reality and fiction. And it was just fascinating to be in the driver's seat at that time and be able to see how that played out. It was something, the, the likes of which we'll never see in comics again. Never. No, you're right. Uh, it, death in character is so commonplace now, but at the time, I just recall just, just how shocking that was. I do want to fast forward a little bit. Uh, so again, you, 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 you have some amazing contributions to the Superman mythos. Uh, the, the death, the, me or the wedding... Uh, Electric Superman, which held a special place in my heart, but also after New 52, when the company rebooted and they undid the, the marriage, they undid everything, you had the series Lois and Clark that revealed that mm -hmm. the Superman, that, that most tries the Superman, was alive and well and secretly living, and you told a beautiful character about a story about Superman's son. We've learned that he had a son in secret that he was yeah. raising. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Because um, to me, I never knew how much sense it made that Superman would have a child until I saw that Superman had a child. And yeah, of course, he'd be an amazing father. Can you talk about the genesis of that? I think, uh, well, that, that goes back to, I had been working on a series called Future's End. And part of that was we were asked to come up with the idea of a, a group of books that would take place somewhere else and as, as a, or, or in a different set of universes type and somewhere down the road. And if you remember, part of it was that DC was going to be moving its offices from New York to California. And so we were building in these kind of ideas of what could happen to characters from 
different times. And at that point, the thought was, well, here are Clark and Lois off on a, on a different world in a different universe. And I just said, well, the logical conclusion is if they've been there for a few years, they've been married and, you know, they have a son. And so we did the story, uh, and these were in the Convergence books. Uh, I did a two-part yep. story uh, in which Clark and Lois have a son, and they name him John. And then uh, as part of that, I had always said to, to Dan DeDio that, you know, John can somehow represent the future. That whether, and, and my thought, uh, one of the thoughts we had at the time was maybe that world is getting destroyed, and Superman and Lois, they have to put young John into a rocket and shoot him off into space. Uh, and that's the only way to get him to safety. But I always saw that as somehow being the future and representing the future. And then after we did that, Dan came to me and he said, you know, we want to work some of these Superman themes and classic elements back into the universe. And that was all part of Rebirth. And find a way to take the Superman they had at that time, who was not married to Lois, the new 52 Superman, if you will, and those that more classic Superman and put them together. Uh, the idea was to advance John to an older age where he's like eight years old and to be able to further explore. I think this is what's really important to understand that it wasn't just to give Superman a son. It was, what can we say about the character in doing so? And I think, once we saw how Clark Kent had been raised and we got to know his parents and we knew those values that he was raised with, the things I talked about, you know, 15 minutes ago, if we see him in turn doing that and if we see all of that and how he and Lois are as parents and how they treat their child and the values they then try and impart in him, I think it really says something more about Superman. And it says something more about Clark. And this whole idea with these characters is that they're all part of this elaborate tapestry. That's what their history is. And it's our job to continue to add to that tapestry and enrich these characters. And I would like to think that the addition of John absolutely did that because I think it gave us a chance to explore another side of Superman. Well, I would like to ask, um, I'm a parent to uh, two sons. I'm a father to two sons. And whenever I read the relationship, and again, I came up on your Superman. So understand when I say this is when I look at the relationship between Pa Kent and Clark, and then the relationship between uh, Superman and John, it's the father that I want to be. Where does that come from? Did, uh, does that come from your upbringing? Does that come from parenting style yourself? Where does, where do you draw that from? Well, you know, you could write a book on that, I suppose. <laughs> Sorry, I know uh, it's a heavy question, but that was one I wanted to hit you I, with. Well, you, you know, I think whenever we write uh, as, as writers, to a certain extent, you try not to write yourself. What you try and do is write the character and, and get your head in that character's space and, and say, if, if you do that, and you have that understanding of them, I think you can draw some logical conclusions as how, that, how that character might behave. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, I think I have a pretty good handle on who, on who Superman is, who Clark is, who Lois is, and how they might act with such a, a set of circumstances. But at the same time, I'd be lying to say that we don't all draw on our own experiences somehow, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, it just so happens that I did grow up in uh, a rural area, a small town of only 2,000 people, which, yes, you could substitute for Smallville, Kansas, I suppose. So I think there's a certain level of understanding there, but it really is. It's the job of any writer is to be able to get inside a character's head or all their characters' heads and be able to make them different and, and kind of communicate that somehow. So... I think the answer to a lot of those questions that you asked is yes, but it's a much more complicated blend than that. Well, I'll hit you up about it some other time then. We're coming towards the end. I do want to ask, uh, to wrap things up with, you have written the list of characters that you've written is a very long one. Uh, who has been your favorite to write so far? And is there a character you haven't written or drawn that you would like to tackle? Uh, I've been very fortunate in that I've been able to do 
just about everything I've ever wanted to do. And, and I've been able to work on almost all characters one way or another. Uh, let's see. I, I don't, I, my favorite really does, this sounds like a cheap answer, but it is true. Um, my favorite tends to be whoever I'm writing at the moment. You, you have to make it that way as a writer. You really do. If you aren't, you're probably not doing justice to the character. I've always been fascinated by Tony Stark and Iron Man. That would be fun to do one day. Uh, there are other ones out there as well. I think um, there are even some darker characters that that I would really like to explore sometime that I just haven't gotten to yet. And and some of those darker themes. So I think there's still a lot out there to be done and some new stuff, um, characters of my own left to do. So I think there's still a lot more that I want to do. And the idea is to eventually somehow get to doing them all. Well, before you wrap up, is there anything that you wanted to, to promote? Uh, Anything that you wanted people to know? How can they support right now in this, uh, the great quarantine, as you called it? Uh, anything that people oh, should be aware lockdown. of? <laughs> I, great well, lockdown. I think the, the, the biggest thing, right. Uh, the, the biggest thing I can say is um, now more than ever, whether it's us as creators or comic companies as publishers or retailers like you, what we really appreciate out there is the support. And I'm amazed that, you know, we've certainly seen the the love for these characters, the love for this medium and this product continue to come through. And I certainly admire what everybody has done as readers to support their local comic shops. I've seen and read and been told so many great stories of what they have done to do that. And I think that's fantastic. So to that, I would say thank you and please keep doing so. Well, Dan, thank you for, uh, for all of your body of work, your passion. You have a lot of fans out there, uh, the folks at the store among them. So thank you so much for that. And I'm going to go ahead and I'll go ahead and end the stream now. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.